It's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Amalbek Aydakev, who is the chair of the National Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction for the Kyrgyz Republic. Also, Ms. Julia Stewart-David, acting director of DG ECHO Disaster Preparedness and Prevention of the European Commission. Ms. Rebecca Freitag, representative of the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth. And also Mr. John Ivers, policy expert and the lead author of the EFDRR Roadmap 21, 20, uh, uh, 2030. In order to proceed with the panel, we, I'm delighted to uh, first introduce our two keynote speakers. And uh, our first keynote speaker today is Ms. Armine Harapetian, uh, Sendai, National Sendai Framework Focal Point for Armenia. And also, I'm delighted to introduce um, uh, our colleague, Mr. Dmitry Mariasin, who is the uh, uh, Deputy Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. As we will proceed with the, uh, with the panelists and the keynote speeches, we will then open up the floor to contributions from participants in the room and present in our virtual um, conference space. And um, uh, we will have uh, uh, co three contributors first from three um, partner sub-regional organizations. And that is Vladko Jovanovsky, the head of Secretariat of Disaster Preparedness and Prevention Initiative for Southeastern Europe. We'll also have an intervention from Mr. Marek Pozniansky, Director General of the Council of Baltic States and also Mr. Uh, Ukashev, Director of Center for Emergency Situations and Disaster Risk Reduction. Dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, we uh, all attended or were able to uh, follow the deliberations of the Ministerial Roundtable uh, yesterday, which um, uh, gave us a very strong pledge to support um, the roadmap for 2021-2030. 20, um, the European uh, Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction um, Roadmap and the Pledge is really providing us with uh, the key priorities for accelerating the implementation of Sendai framework for, for the next period. This document was produced after almost one year of consultations, interviews, discussions, uh, and we are now in the position to take stock of some key elements of the first five years of the implementation of Sendai framework in the region, but also set um, priorities for the next 10 years. In this regard, the roadmap will be the key vehicle to uh, learn the lessons from the past and also to set uh, priorities for acceleration of the implementation of the Sendai framework. I'm very pleased that today with us in, on the panel is also Rebecca, who made an appeal yesterday to all of us to ministers, to all participants at the FDRR, that time matters and the time is to, to act now. The roadmap is about it, is about how we act now and how after this forum, we start a journey for the next 10 years that will help us deal with a more complex risk landscape in the region and globally and in every single country and community we live in. So uh, in order to start our discussions, I'm very pleased to invite uh, Ms. Uh, Armini Harapetian, who uh, was a co-chair of the working group uh, composed of 25 member states uh, that actually led the process of developing the roadmap and first started by learning lessons from the review of the previous roadmap and then contributed to a very consultative process involving, involving multiple stakeholders um, to, uh, to develop this important document. Um, we will hear from Armenia about the 
process and the key priorities from the roadmap uh, in order then to uh, start uh, our uh, deliberations in this uh, plenary session. Armini, the pleasure is my pleasure to give you the floor. Dear honorary guests, dear participants, dear chair, I want to first of all extend my sincere gratitude to the government of Portugal and to the municipality of Motosinhos for this exceptional possibility to be hosted here and to be presenting the outcomes of our work, which we did during one entire year. I want to extend also my sincere gratitude, first and foremost, to my colleague and co-chair of the working group, to Mrs. Janet Edwards, uh, the former Sendai National Focal Point for Sweden, and to congratulate her with her retirement and thank her for the all lessons I learned from her. I was novice in this uh, domain and I learned a lot to work and to develop such an important document like we have now and we will be uh, discussing. So uh, it is my honor and my pleasure to represent the document that we are discussing already two days and which will be guiding us uh, during a whole decade. The roadmap 2021 to 2030 for a disaster resilient European and Central Asian region. What is this as a document and do we consider it as a simple document or not? First of all, I want to say that this is a document with, with a heritage and with a rich inheritance to give for the f future. The heritage which it takes as all the lessons learned and all the investigations and studies done by our dear expert John Ivers and all the colleagues who were working on that, on what gaps and challenges were remained behind uh, from the five years of experience of implementation of Sendai framework and the roadmap for 2015 to 2020. And uh, this uh, document is uh, built on consultations with European and Central Asian countries with the review of the progress of implementation, as I said, of the roadmap. Uh, uh, lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandem pandemic response and recovery. And the roadmap is also informed by, by the, from the Global Platform 2019 and uh, the guiding principles of the Global Platform 2022. It is important to say that the roadmap, uh, uh, the present roadmap, uh, consists of four, uh, four main areas of um, uh, uh, four, four main areas that will be uh, guiding our understand uh, uh, and will be leading to uh, to implementation of the Sendai priorities. And these priority areas are understanding and, and communicating existing emergency and future systemic risks. Inclus the uh, second uh, area: inclusive and collaborative systems for governance and decision making. Um, and uh, <clears throat> supporting investments in resilience and pre preparedness for response and resilience recovery. What is important to mention that all of these priority areas uh, are divided into, uh, each one is divided into four sectors of uh, development uh, that will need development and investment. And uh, all of them are discussed in a very detailed manner, emphasizing gaps, challenges and current status, and also trans uh, giving the transformative opportunities and way forward for each of them. Uh, I must mention that this document, uh, you will find it very concise, very uh, brief and uh, well organized in my understanding because you will find uh, it systematized in the way that it can be a very good tool for, uh, for the national governments, regional, all, everybody who is going to do um, to work for the Sendai framework implementation. Uh, and the most important thing that I want to say that the document has a special part for uh, mentioning all those five leading enabling approaches, which is the all of the society inclusive and responsive approaches to accelerate and understanding and uh, investment in disaster risk reduction and resi resilience, coherent approaches to leverage the disaster risk reduction agenda and to improve coherence with 
with other global agendas to risk informed future climate change, environment, biodiversity, sustainable development, equity and inclusion, green and other policy strategies, investment and action uh, agendas at all levels. Uh, of course, the third enabling approach, the system wide approach is to protect critical infrastructure systems and investments against future climate and disaster risk. Uh, the important, very important part and in enabling approach, which I emphasize also all the time, evidence-based approaches to risk-informed policies, strategies, plans, regulatory frameworks, decisions and actions. And finally, regional, local and contextualized approaches to support transboundary national and local policy and strategy coherence, investments and collaboration. To conclude, I just want to mention that this is not just a tool. In my understanding, any tool can be turned into a weapon. Into a weapon to fight for our important goal is to build resilience, is to implement the Sendai framework principles. I thank you very much and I want to engage you all in very in, in important and interesting discussion. Thank you very much and still talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Armine, and uh, uh, I would like to really um, uh, congratulate you and uh, Sweden, Armine and Sweden, for leading this process and getting to this point when the EFDRR yesterday endorsed the, the roadmap as a, uh, as a key document for accelerating the implementation of Sendai framework in the region. Um, and uh, thank you also for your intervention today, providing us the key features of the roadmap. And I'm sure that uh, all participants at, the, at this conference have the opportunity to consult the document, which is online for the details of those uh, priorities uh, aligned around the four, uh, four areas. Uh, with this, it's now my pleasure to invite a second keynote speaker, Mr. Dimitri Mariasin from uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe to provide us um, uh, his uh, and his organization's views on the uh, broader uh, landscape and how the implementation of Sendai framework um, priorities uh, fit into um, the overall development agenda uh, in the region. We know that nothing undermines uh, more development than a disaster. And um, uh, we would like Mr. Mariasin to hear uh, your perspectives on priorities for the implementation of Sendai framework and for of the, uh, the implementation of this uh, uh, concrete roadmap in the context of uh, the Europe and Central Asia region. Uh, Mr. Mariasin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Bivol. Excellencies, dear, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure for me to address this plenary session today and to share UN Economic Commission for Europe uh, reflections on the EFDRR roadmap um, uh, on which uh, uh, I congratulate uh, all of us. Uh, I, I really, I'm really pleased to hear that it was adopted and uh, I also am uh, uh, delighted uh, to hear the presentation of um, the colleague from Armenia. Um, we really believe that uh, this roadmap is an important step towards accelerating the implementation of the Sendai framework uh, in in this uh, time frame of 2021-2030. Before I start my more formal uh, remarks, I'd like to to share with you that indeed, as, as Octavian has mentioned, um, I'm 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 currently the deputy head of UN Economic Commission for Europe, uh, which is a normative body dealing with a number of aspects uh, relevant to disaster risk reduction, uh, but beyond that also many other issues. However, before that, I've, I've had um, a fairly long career in the field with, uh, with UNDP. And uh, most recently, in fact, as, uh, as the head of UNDP office in Armenia, uh, where I could firsthand appreciate the critical juncture uh, at which many countries in, in, in this region are when it comes to uh, the nexus between climate risk, uh, the environmental situation in any given uh, context, you know, in terms of, you know, landscapes, uh, forest cover and many other elements and the importance of profound behavior change that needs to take place at all levels um, for risk 
to be managed much more effectively. Uh, I could witness firsthand, and I'd like to, to know that uh, I'm very, very aware of the efforts of the Armenian government to systematize the, the management of risk and disaster risk reduction. I'm aware firsthand how prevention uh, can, can really make a difference in a context like that. And, uh, uh, you know, I would be very happy if there is time later in the discussion to share uh, some of these experiences with you. But now I would like to, um, to, come, to come back to what uh, we from UNIC perspective think are some of the critical uh, elements uh, of the EFDRR uh, roadmap. Um, and uh, I'd like to start by, by noting a more general uh, point that with growing impacts of climate change and urbanization, increased disaster risk, we need to accelerate the implementation uh, on all aspects of the Sendai framework. Uh, for us in the UNICE, we cover 56 countries of the region. Uh, that includes both developing countries as well uh, as uh, US, Canada, and the countries of the European Union. Uh, and of course, progress ac across the region is uneven, and we will need to work very hard to, to accelerate on all fronts, but also in all countries, to make sure that we can overcome uh, the, the different levels of preparedness uh, for, for implementation. And we believe that in this, it is critical to start with instruments, frameworks, and tools that have proven their effectiveness, that are there uh, and to which many of the countries are uh, a party. And we believe also that it's important then to take these proven experiences and replicate, um, um, adapt them to each country's context. So I will uh, build my intervention around uh, the examples of some of the uh, legal instruments uh, of UNECE, other UNEC guidelines and good practice documents and activities on the ground that have concretely translated in reduced disaster risks and in our view can be of great help to countries in the region um, in implementing the Sendai framework and translating the EFDRR roadmap into action. Uh, the roadmap is an extremely useful and uh, comprehensive document, and it clearly identified key ch challenges and key actions to be undertaking in the next 10 years. I will not dare to cover all of them in my intervention, but would like to focus on just four aspects, which, based on our experience, are particularly important and require attention. Um, and not just attention, but actually political commitment and investments including by international players and in domestic finance in the national budgets. In our view, these four elements are strengthening transboundary cooperation, managing multiple hazards, enhancing multi-level governance, and very importantly, focusing on prevention. So um, let me start with transboundary cooperation, which is one uh, element of, of the roadmap. Uh, the roadmap recognizes the importance of transboundary cooperation and collaborative systems, uh, systems of governance and decision making, which are indeed very important. They, the critical realization, uh, you know, we were all reminded, critical realization of the last year uh, when we observed the devastating floods um, this summer um, all over Europe, that the risks know no borders. And disaster risk cannot be reduced if we only manage it within political boundaries. Without transboundary cooperation, risk can be transferred to other countries and even be amplified. On the contrary, effective cooperation can make risk management more effective by sharing information and solutions and implementing actions where they are most cost-effective. One example um, of what we at UC University um, are doing uh, actually two examples I would like to highlight are the Water Convention and the Industrial Accidents Convention, which are serviced by UNIC as a secretariat, uh, and which are really key instruments to reduce water-related risks and risks from technological hazards through transboundary cooperation. What they do is offer a rule-based approach to several key dimensions of risk management, specifically understanding risk and communicating risks, including through information sharing, notification mechanisms, and early warning. The implementation of these two conventions has resulted in mapping of industrial hazardous installations and flood risks. It's a very concrete element, but 
I'm, I'm, you know, I'm also highlighting this because I, we, I think we all could witness how, how um, uh, prone to flooding is even the Western Europe, uh, as well as support to countries to adapt to, to climate-related risks. Uh, I don't need to go to go into details. I think this this was already highlighted during the the past uh, two days. Uh, but uh, I would like to note, particularly, the important role of um, uh, of the initiative of the European Union, which works to enhance understanding of transboundary risks, for example, in its recent revisions of the Union Civil Protection Mechanism. Uh, uh, we really think this is one of the best examples of, of a systemic approach, which covers uh, which covers many countries, and we hope that in the pan-European region, these approaches uh, of the European Union can be taken as an example uh, and, and brought, brought forward. And, and we really hope that the whole pan-European region can build on, on this very important practice. The other very important aspect, you know, in addition to understanding, communicating risks and early warning, um, is enhancing capacity uh, of governance and institutions to cooperate nationally and across uh, borders. And uh, I would like to, uh, to, to bring to your attention the UN DRR, uh, Words into Action guidelines. We as UNUC contributed to it, uh, among with other partners, but it's led by UNDRR. Uh, and this is an implementation guide, so a very practical guide uh, for, uh, for both for man-made and technological hazards, and specifically for addressing water-related disasters and transboundary cooperation. Uh, they, uh, you know, the, you know the, this, this body of, of guidance provides concrete examples, case studies on how to implement the Sendai framework in relation to these specific risks. And I would like to once again say, without such practical capacity inside each of the region's governments to implement um, and to, to engage in transboundary cooperation, it will be very difficult to, to address it systemically. Second area, multi-hazard risks. Um, climate change is going to be uh, the number one cause of disasters going forward. Uh, that's, that's our expectation. And that is also true for technological incidents, in fact. They are normally referred to as man-made. However, we uh, we know that uh, they are, in fact, uh, multi-hazards, where natural hazards lead to technological risks uh, or enhance, the, enhance their impact. And uh, we believe that this demands particular attention, demands enhanced risk assessment and mapping. As one of the example, UNIC supported countries in the Danube Delta. So it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a broad region uh, which covers both the European Union and the countries and the neighboring neighborhood countries. Um, we supported the Danube, Danube Delta countries to work together to protect uh, what is a unique natural heritage and a unique habitat, a unique ecosystem, and mitigate the consequences of any oil spills through improved cross-border cooperation. As a result, Moldova, Ukraine, Romania prepared a transboundary map of multiple natural and industrial hazards. So here is the multi-hazard approach. Drafted a joint contingency plan. This is also an example of excellent transboundary cooperation and practical one, uh, and stepped up their preparedness through the first ever trilateral preparedness and response exercise. We really believe that we need more of such actions in other parts of the region, and we as a UNIC stand ready to work with all of you on, on expanding this type of cooperation. Now, thirdly, the multi-level governance. Um, the issue of transboundary cooperation leads me to this overarching important to the overarching importance of uh, inclusive, multi-level governance uh, from transboundary to national to subnational and local levels. I would like to uh, express our full uh, support for the steps presented in area two of the roadmap, uh, uh, which calls for inclusive and collaborative systems for governance. And uh, if you allow me additional examples of actions to support um, these and other areas of the, of the roadmap. Uh, in our view, um, one of the key challenges, in fact, uh, is inclusivity, is connecting stakeholders to decision-making uh, at all levels, uh, building cooperation and integrating actions between different sectors uh, and at different scales is not easy. It takes time and deliberate effort. Uh, and it's very hard to measure it too. So, you know, because these processes are time intensive, uh, inclusive relationships, multi-stakeholder consultations, they all take, uh, you know, effort time. But we do believe that it's worth investing effort and time, that the outcomes are better and more effective policies with strong ownership result uh, and that 
they can form then a basis for implementation, uh, including with the involvement of private sector, academia, and the public. Um, as one specific mechanism for this, UNEC has brought in place national policy dialogues um, to help create a basis for cooperation between relevant stakeholders and institutions and to deal with a variety of development issues. Uh, as, as examples, we support such dialogues on water, forest management, housing, and land management, as well as on technological hazards. As a specific exam example, uh, last month, Serbia became um, actually the first country in the pan-European region, uh, we congratulate the government of Serbia on this, to launch a national policy dialogue on industrial safety. Uh, we, we are looking forward to the outcomes of, of, of the dialogue and we also stand, stand by for uh, launching the round of such dialogues in Central Asia countries, as well as another example, next year. We believe national policy dialogues on industrial safety is just one example of multi-level governance, uh, and we look forward to working with all of you to make them a success. Uh, now, you know, very importantly, uh, it, it links to, to another aspect of, of our work, which is public participation. As you know, um, we, at, at UNEC, we also host the uh, Orhus Convention Secretariat. This is a convention that is about the the uh, right to get information on environmental issues. We do believe that uh, human rights aspects of disaster risk reduction need to be spoken about. We do believe that uh, access to information, involvement of civil society and broader citizen groups, especially in local communities that may be affected or at, are at risk, are a critical element of multi-level governance. And we stand ready to work also through this instrument with many of you. Finally, prevention. Um, we believe that prevention is essential in implementing all work areas of the roadmap. And uh, as we heard uh, on Wednesday during uh, one of the focus thematic discussions, uh, the one on industrial and chemical accidents, prevention is truly the essence uh, of what disaster risk management is about. Prevention is better than cure. This old wisdom holds for technological accidents and for any other preventable types of disasters. Prevention is less costly than responding and recovering, and more importantly, lives and all kinds of environmental and economic damage can be spared. So in our view, uh, going forward, we as, as international partners, together with, with, with the member states in the pan-European region, will need to make prevention a number one priority. Uh, from UNECE side, uh, this is a critical element of recovering better, um, uh, also from the COVID-19 pandemic, because we need to realize that in the post-pandemic world, countries will face very difficult choices when it comes to their domestic budget allocations. And we believe that they need to clearly understand that no matter how significant the toll on the economy pandemic had, no matter how much needs to go into the recovery activities, it will be critical to invest limited domestic budget resources in prevention uh, on the DRR side so that much bigger uh, uh, risks, much bigger, much bigger human uh, loss, and much bigger expenses can be avoided uh, in the future. Such large expenses for addressing a disaster, a preventable disaster, I emphasize, uh, are probably currently unaffordable in the post-pandemic world for many of the countries of the post-pan-European region. Let me end by thanking the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction for their leadership for hosting us today for the excellent cooperation we have and, and express our hope that we continue this cooperation also with key stakeholders present in today's session. And once again, congratulate um, all of us um, on the development and adoption of this important roadmap uh, as it comes at a time where action is at the core of disaster risk management. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marias and uh, Dimitri uh, for sharing uh, your uh, uh, views and the views of the uh, UNECE uh, with particular focus on four priority areas and providing us also with very concrete examples of, uh, um, of how we could uh, effectively move forward in those areas. I'd like to thank both keynote speakers, uh, Armin and Dmitri, and to turn now to our panelists for a better understanding how the principles which the two keynote speakers uh, brought up as key principles of the, of the roadmap, which include identifying shared gaps and opportunities uh, for enhancing disaster resilience in the region, 
uh, also putting in place effective arrangements at uh, national uh, and regional level for um, identifying good practices and pathways. And third, supporting uh, systems for regional collaboration and shared learning uh, could, uh, could be uh, best advanced in implementing the roadmap. And in order to start our, our panel discussions, I would like uh, to invite first our distinguished panelists from uh, Kyrgyzstan, Mr. Uh, Almabek Haidakev, who uh, is uh, leading the national platform for disaster risk reduction in the country, to share his perspectives on uh, how he sees the added value of the EFDR roadmap for the priorities and the ways how Kyrgyzstan implements the Sendai framework at national level, but also any opportunities for uh, regional or sub-regional cooperation. Uh, Mr. Aydakev, uh, the floor is yours. Спасибо, уважаемый Октавиан. Добрый день, уважаемые участники сегодняшнего форума. Я хотел коротко рассказать вам о Сендайской программе в нашей республике и о взглядах на дорожную карту. Говоря о Синдайской программе, мы говорим, что для нашей республики она имела очень важное значение и имеет огромное значение. И это было связано с тем, что не только снижение риска бедствия, но и изменение политики и государственного инструмента подхода к процессу управления. Это и сфера законодательства, ну и, естественно, и подходы к практической реализации и достижению целевых задач, которые были основаны на трех главных факторах. Первое — это наше географическое расположение и горный ландшафт, который подразумевает высокие риски стихийных бедствий, от которого страдает население и экономика страны. Второе — это необходимость и мотивация на сотрудничество, потому что без передовых практик, обмена опыта невозможно двигаться вперед. Мы в поиске инструментов, новых подходов и также новых партнеров для реализации различных задач синдайской программы. И третий подход — это максимальная вовлеченность в процессы снижения риска бедствий всех участников. Это государственные, частные и местные сообщества и общественные институты. И именно такая, такое позиционирование позволило нам буквально в 2018 году принять новый закон, в котором гармонично вошли такие термины, как бедствие, риск бедствий, снижение риска бедствий. И мы пошли немножко дальше создали специальную подсистему, в которой аккумулировалась национальная платформа по снижению риска бедствий, именно как коррекционный механизм и институт вовлеченности широких слоев населения и институтов. Второе, кроме законодательства, у нас шла очень кропотливая работа по выработке стратегии, но учитывая наши национальные особенности принятия нормативных актов, правительством было принято политическое решение о принятии концепции комплексной защиты населения и территории от чрезвычайной ситуации до 30 -го года с планом реализации его первого этапа 18-22 года. Сегодня мы стоим на пороге э, разработки второго этапа. И вот здесь вот, э, изучая дорожную карту, мы поняли, что э, на второй этап у нас гармонично войдут э, приоритеты дорожной карты Европейского форума. Например, первый приоритет мы говорим о изменении климата и зеленой экономике. 24 сентября этого года Кабинет министров Крымской Республики принял обязательство определенного национального устойчивого вклада в Парижский саммит, соглашение. И там уже сектор чрезвычайной ситуации, адаптационных мер, она уже выработана. То есть цели, меры, действия, они выработаны, они гармонично войдут у нас на второй этап. Отдельно хотел рассказать, как у нас реализуется. Вот в плане первого этапа четыре приоритета. 53 мероприятия, 16 из них успешно уже реализованы. Остальные на разной стадии реализации, но даже с учетом последствий COVID, преодоления COVID, там результаты вот достаточно высокие. И на двух примерах я хотел остановиться. Это первое, это э, единая информационная управляющая система Крымской Республики, которая включает в себя три компонента. Это центр управления кризисными ситуациями, система 112 с мобильным приложением и система оповещения населения об угрозах. Именно этот потенциал, когда мы развивали его давно, уже начали, ну, реализовываем, дальше реализовываем, именно этот компонент позволил успешно преодолевать многие вопросы по преодолению COVID для принятия стратегических решений, быстрого мобильного оповещения населения и так далее. И второе, это в 2019 году 
У нас было создано, решение правительства создана единая комплексная система мониторинга и прогнозирования чрезвычайной ситуации, куда вошли все национальные и отраслевые научные институты. Это лаборатории, станции, которые в ежедневном режиме работают. И в этом же компоненте создан, в системе создан центр обработки данных, куда аккумулируются все данные от этих институтов. И в том числе и ГИС программы и наблюдение Земли. Создан веб-портал. И пошли еще немножко дальше. Это участие вовлеченность населения в процессе оповещения об угрозе или фактически произошедшей чрезвычайной ситуации. И вот впереди стоит задача, чтобы вот эта единая информационная система и центр мониторинга, они объединились в один. Вот, увязать их для того, чтобы иметь реальную картину в режиме реального времени. И вот изучая дорожную карту из сайта управления СРБ по Европе и Азии, на ваш сайте я посмотрел, что в европейской части создана аналогичная система, как Информ, Коперник или же Призма в Монголии. Мы поняли, что у нас одинаковые подходы к процессу снижения риска бедствий, но в то же время... У нас понятно, что потенциал разный, но подходы одинаковые. И проблемы одинаковые. Проблемы одинаковые в плане того, что вот предыдущий оратор тоже сказал об инструментах и роли местных сообществ или местных муниципалитетов, как мы говорим. И в этой рамке я хотел поделиться о том, что вот задача, целевая задача есть, индайская программа говорит о стратегиях, планах снижения риска бедствий. И в этом году мы смогли успешно вместе с ФАО и региональным центром Алматы, Укаш присутствует здесь, господин Укаш, мы смогли реализовать очень хороший план снижения риска бедствий для местного сообщества и сделать модельный отчет о воздействии стихийных бедствий на сельскохозяйственный сектор. Я думаю, это инструмент как раз таки, мы реализовали вот этот инструмент, но в пилотном режиме. Я думаю, уважаемый Октавиан, впереди у нас большая работа в этом направлении. Хотелось бы, чтобы именно с РБО мы продолжили эту работу в разных регионах, чтобы был более, более такой большой масштаб. Ну и отдельно хочу остановиться. Вот в 2019 году мы инициатива у РБО по повышению сточек бедствия и ускорению синдайской программы, проект Центральной Азии. Вот несмотря на COVID... И в такие сложные ситуации и в стране, и в регионе мы смогли все-таки начать работу и проделать большую работу в плане выработки стратегии. После концепции это очень удобно. Не в начале стратегии, а в начале концепции, и планы, а и выработать из него стратегии. Второе – это стратегическое планирование. Третье – это система дезинтар синдай для того, чтобы видеть картину каждой страны. И решение уже принято. Следующее – это и разработка двухкомпонентного сайта МЧС, где аккумулировались глобальные платформы. Этот сайт запущен уже в работе. Это достаточно... Вот, несмотря на сложности, мы смогли это реализовать. Спасибо вашим экспертам. И эта работа будет продолжена, я думаю. И кроме этого, город Бишкек присоединился, наша столица присоединилась к программе устойчивости городов. И здесь в контексте дорожной карты, Синдайская программа и то, что стратегия принята для стран Центральной Азии, вот впереди стоит работа интересная, чтобы выработать нам и второй и план второго этапа, реализовать дорожную карту и увязать его вместе с стратегией нашего региона. Кроме того, я хочу сказать, что задача есть, она очень интересная, синдайская программа. Там очень много проблем, но и путей решения достаточно много. Об инструментах мы говорим уже второй день. Мы, я думаю, будем двигаться. И здесь самое главное, что без сотрудничества мы не обойдемся. И завершая, я хочу сказать, что в рамках синдайской программы у нас кроме концепции, очень много реализуется мероприятий. Это и отселение населения, это и социальная инфраструктура, это и специальные превентивные меры по, у нас, как называется, безопасному пропуску палатках в селях вход. Это и безопасный город, чтобы исключить, уменьшить смертность населения и так далее. То есть эта синдайская программа, она дала основу для того, чтобы двигаться вперед. И здесь сотрудничество, обмен передовыми практиками играет очень важную, ценную роль. И мы бы хотели, чтобы, вот я сказал, что мы в поисках инструментов и в поисках э, наших э, партнеров для реализации различных задач. У меня все, если есть вопросы, я готов ответить на них. О синдайской программе можно говорить часами, о снижении рисков бедствий, важности. Э, каждый выступающий говорит, я думаю, что здесь сотрудничество и развитие совместное по разным направлениям можно находить успешные практики. 
И мы готовы, также Кыргызстан готов делиться лучшими практиками и быть э, для того, чтобы снизить нагрузку на население и снизить нагрузку на экономику. Особенно, учитывая пандемию COVID-19, еще никто не отменял. Спасибо. Спасибо. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Aydakev, for sharing your perspective. We learned from Mr. Aydakev about uh, the, uh, uh, the potential uh, contribution of the roadmap to country-level efforts with particular focus on the coherence between uh, climate uh, agenda and disaster risk reduction. You also mentioned uh, a very important uh, domain being the risk knowledge and uh, transboundary cooperation for better understanding risks. And uh, also you, uh, uh, you drew the linkages between the a recently uh, adopted uh, disaster risk reduction strategy for Central Asia and the, the regional roadmap for Europe and Central Asia and complementarities between the, the two approaches. I thank you very much and we'll certainly have an opportunity to uh, maybe uh, receive some additional questions from the audience. Um, and now uh, I would like to invite our second panelist who is uh, joining uh, virtually, joining online, and that is Ms. Julia Stewart-David. She is the um, uh, acting director for preparedness and prevention at uh, uh, DG ECHO, uh, the European Commission. As we know, the European Union and the European Commission is a key actor for disaster risk reduction in Europe, uh, but also in, um, in Central Asia, not only for the work undertaken in its member states, but in, through the Union Civil Protection Mechanism. Uh, in three, 33 countries uh, and also contributing to, as we just heard from Mr. Aydakev, the European Commission is contributing uh, also to support the Central Asia Initiative to accelerate, accelerate the implementation of Sendai framework. Um, the European Union has been uh, actively involved and engaged in the, in the development of Sendai framework and then through the Sendai action plan, the implementation of Sendai framework. Uh, so, um, uh, Julia, my question to you would be, um, how would you see the first five years of the implementation of Sendai Framework from, the, uh, from your perspective, knowing also that you have um, a, a rich experience uh, stretching over many years in terms of uh, humanitarian, but also disaster preparedness and disaster prevention work, and also how much the, uh, how do you see the, uh, the uh, implementation of the, uh, of the roadmap um, from the perspective of, uh, uh, of uh, the efforts undertaken by the uh, European Union. The floor is yours. Thank you, dear excellencies, uh, um, co-panelists, colleagues. It's a, a real honor to be here in this brave new world of virtual panels and hybrid events. Uh, so cold greetings from Brussels to warm uh, Portugal and to our dear hosts. Um, and before I get to your question, which is uh, a very key one, I just wanted to mention that it's actually a very special year for us here uh, in Brussels in the Union Civil Protection Me Mechanism. It's our 20th anniversary and uh, we're seeing a lot of change, um, some of it for the good and some of it more challenging. Um, for 20 years now, any country in the world has been able to call upon the Union Civil Protection Mechanism to assist when its own capacity to respond to a disaster um, is overwhelmed. Um, and uh, I have to say that this is one of the most challenging years we have ever faced. Um, to put this into context, between 2001 and 2019, we would be called upon on an average of 20 times a year to assist governments. Um, and this year, uh, we're already at 104 such activations, as we call them. Of course, much of this is in the context of COVID, which is challenging us all, and I'll come back to that. Um, but we have also this year seen uh, serious flooding um, and uh, increasing intensity of forest fires from the north of Europe through to the south. Um, and some countries, which are very rarely hit by disasters, such as our dear colleagues in Belgium uh, and in Germany, um, suffered life-threatening uh, disasters this year. Um, and I think all of that shows us that we need to keep gearing up our efforts to address disaster risk. So 
how have we seen this? Five years already. Incredible to, to say that. Um, uh, we have indeed seen significant progress in the longer efforts on um, disaster risk management. And uh, let me take you through, if I can, very briefly, a couple of examples per priority of the Sendai uh, framework. First of all, to face and to prepare for our risks, we need to understand them. We know that. Um, uh, we certainly see at the European Union robust understanding of risk as absolutely key to all of the investments, to the system to the uh, government decision-making. Um, and therefore, we have um, in place in our legislation uh, a system to ensure that our uh, so-called participating states, so the EU member states and our six uh, additional countries to the mechanism, do indeed submit and work on their national risk assessments together. And what we've seen, now we're reaching our third cycle um, uh, under this framework, uh, is that the understanding, the depth and the quality of risk assessment work is very much improving. We've worked on methodologies together, um, we've worked on providing guidance, um, and uh, as we move forward, uh, what we see, of course, is that the complexity of risk, the interdependency, and the transboundary effects are the areas we need to work on most. This independency, I think, was is one of the hugest les lessons from COVID. You know, we all know it in theory, but our politicians now are certainly very aware of how disasters can spread uh, in their consequences very quickly. That provides us with an opportunity. Our opportunity is to strengthen the legal provisions. We have done that in particular to focus on this area of cross-border border or transboundary risks. We can have the most perfect systems in the world at a national level, but then if the consequences are to the neighbours and the neighbours are not prepared, um, we have the same same uh, devastating impact. So at a pan-European level, we have already done a wildfire risk across the uh, European continent and also the first EU climate risk assessment is going to come out uh, in the next year. We're also working on scenarios. So we can see the trends. Um, we can see the trends uh, and we can see the realities and therefore we need to plan together uh, to make sure that uh, we are ready for these cross-border effects. Very interesting new area of work for us at the European Union. And of course, um, we still try and bring together the knowledge. And I am happy to say, and you see it in my background, I hope that as the 7th of December, we will be launching uh, the Union Civil Protection Knowledge Network. And we hope that will provide a platform for all of you to come together um, to look for and to find and to share each other's experience and knowledge. Very briefly, on objective two, national governments are, of course, in charge of their own risk management process, but we continue to support that and we support it in very specific financial ways. We have had uh, our colleagues in Croatia, in Greece, in Latvia, all um, uh, supported financially to improve their disaster risk management frameworks. I think I haven't time to go into it today, but again, very interesting examples. So we want to share know-how, we want to share lessons. Then, of course, the investment case. We know that disasters are costly. I highlighted earlier um, uh, quite how badly Europe is being affected at the moment by disaster. Um, even if we just talk about hydrometeorological and climate disasters, we have an estimated 12 billion euro cost a year in economic losses. I mean, this is a very key case for investing in disaster risk reduction. What does that look like? Um, of course, we have to invest on the ground. So we're at the start of a new financial period in the European Union. We have a big instrument known as the European Structural and Investment Funds, where 10 billion euros worth of money in the last period were invested specifically on concrete, local, regional, disaster risk management and climate change adaptation projects. And now we have more funding available. One of the consequences of COVID is we have a new package known as Next Generation EU, where billions of euro are available to build back better from this awful pandemic and its impact 
impact on society. Sadly, we're still in the middle of the disasters uh, that we do know. Um, however, this disaster proofing, this do no harm and this opportunity to reinforce our uh, work on DRR is there. Um, so we have also produced some evidence uh, recently. Um, I'd like to just quickly draw your attention to the fact we have done some work with the World Bank, um, very interesting work on the economic case for investment. Happy to share some of that later, perhaps uh, also um, during the discussion. And last, um, but of course by no, by no means least, I started with it under priority four, enhancing our preparedness efforts for response. Well, whilst in the midst of these 104 activations. We work with our colleagues across the civil protection authorities in Europe to improve the system. And in particular, we're working on something known as RescueU, which is bringing in additional capacity to be able to support each other in areas such as emergency medical, CBRN, and of course, forest fire situation, something which we see getting more and more intense every year. Um, I think I will leave it at that, um, and I hope that we'll have some chance for some questions. Um, but clearly, it's a very complex risk landscape that we are facing. Not everything can be anticipated. Not everything can be prevented. But clearly, we need to work on the system. And finally, of course, we need to bring our populations with us. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. Thank you so much, Ms. Stuart, David, um, uh, Julia. You touched upon uh, some very important uh, um, uh, uh, areas of progress, but also some challenges uh, that uh, you are uh, addressing as you, we look forward to accelerate the implementation of Sendai, including the more complex risk uh, landscape, the importance of transboundary efforts, and uh, also the very important work on uh, developing scenarios and uh, uh, also looking into the climate-related scenarios. And uh, on that, um, I just a point of reflection. I was thinking as um, uh, the European Union will be conducting this uh, climate risk assessment and scenario building, how much the roadmap actually could uh, be used as a vehicle for other member states um, in the region of Europe and Central Asia to also learn uh, um, uh, from the experience of uh, European Union and UCPM in moving in moving forward. And I think Mr. Aydake was also mentioning about uh, the Central Asia disaster risk reduction strategies, which also looks at the, the transboundary risks and at the climate uh, the climate impacts. Thank you so much, and I'm I'm sure we uh, we uh, should have some time left at the end of the session. For for Q and A's, which I, I, I'm, I'm sure we will have from the audience. But um, uh, before the the Q and A's, I'd like to invite uh, our next panelist, uh, Rebecca Freitag, uh, who um, uh, is um, uh, uh, representing a very important stakeholder group. Uh, it's the uh, United Nations uh, major group on, of uh, children, young people. And um, yesterday, uh, Rebecca, you uh, addressed the ministerial roundtable. Um, and I have to, to, to confess that was really a, a statement that touched our hearts and our minds uh, as we, atten we were attending the ministerial roundtable. You brought your personal or the, the perspective of, of, a, of a child, of a young person uh, who uh, 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 experienced a disaster. You also provided us with a vision of how we can accelerate our preventive efforts with a concrete example. And you then um, uh, ended your presentation by um, an imperative call uh, that we need to, to really act now and uh, there is no time to lose. As you listen to the deliberations uh, in this forum and in this particular panel, in discussion about the roadmap, do you think that the priorities and the way how we see the roadmap corresponds to the views and the expectations of children and young people? Or where would you like us uh, to move together uh, collectively in accelerating the implementation of the roadmap? The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, <clears throat> first of all, it's all about the implementation, right? But just looking at the document, it's great to have it. I, like As a young people, it really feels kind of relieved, it feels good to know there's a roadmap, we have concrete steps, and like most of what I read, I, I really totally agree. 
I've detected three particular areas that I would like to highlight, but I've also three points where I think there maybe we should stress that more or it's actually even missing in the roadmap. So, you know, I sometimes call my generation a crisis generation because we have been through a financial crisis. We are in the midst of a health crisis, a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis. And we see that all these crises are interlinked and sometimes even enforce each other. So the logical consequence for us is that a true answer to stop that is a systemic answer. And now applying that here to, to disaster risk reduction means let's look at these great outcomes we already have, Sunday framework, climate agreements, SDGs, and really see synergies and interconnections. And if we really want to tackle the root of all problems, for me, this is still implementing the SDGs, basically, because, I mean, all the consequences that we now have as a disaster are consequences of not having implemented the SDGs. Um, and so my second point is um, a true all-of-society approach. Uh, I've, you know, I was traveling so much talking about with people about the SDGs, and I see they are so eager to be part of that. There are so many change agents on the floor. And now, how can we empower them? That means we have to give them a framework where they can act. And this also means reduce bureaucracy. Reduce bureaucracy to really create that space and then let beautiful miracles happen, I would say. No, but really local level knows best what they need. Um, so empowering that level is important. And I think also what we see now with all the crises, um, we also need to <coughs> relocalize our economy and infrastructure to make them less vulnerable for global uh, shocks. Um, and that also, of course, means like having the future is say in DRR strategies, and especially in the implementation. I mean, we young people, we do have that mindset that we, we break the silos and, you know, we, we, are, we are not satisfied with any excuses. So it's really, it's really an advantage to have youth on board. Um, but also when, you know, when I was in the flood area, it were mainly young volunteers where their spirit was still up. They were taking the mud out of the houses. They were delivering food packages and building back wherever they could. And then the third area is um, investments. I mean, you know, let's face it, it's all about the money in the end. Still, unfortunately. <laughs> but really, investments um, are something we should turn our head towards. And one of the main concerns of my generation is greenwashing. So I really have high hopes on the EU taxonomy that brings us clear um, criteria. But like, if you're brave enough, I would suggest to go beyond that, to go further, because we young people do not believe that more or mere economic growth will bring us healing, on the contrary. So, you know, we also keep as, uh, questioning the whole economic system in the end, like uh, how can we put back values that are really important for our societies? How can we put back regeneration of nature back into the center of our economic system? Um, yeah, and then what is missing? <laughs> so uh, one point is uh, cybersecurity. I think that needs more attention. Um, I think we really have a blind eye on that. Uh, the other point is jobs and trainings. Um, we need skilled workers to build up that resilient infrastructure. And at least from Germany, I know that we do already have a lack of skilled workers when it comes to building up renewable energies, for example, uh, or net infrastructure, or whatever. So um, I really think that, and then I was asking neighboring countries and they all face the same problem. So. <laughs> And we do not even have those training places in place. So that would mean in the near future, we will all compete uh, on trained, skilled workers, actually. And um, lastly, what's missing is also um, a mindset shift, right? We need to have different, like we need to have our different values again in our society. And... 
um, young people are already at the forefront. Like we do think interconnected. We do think empowering grassroots level is important. We also think long term. This is also one thing, right? Like how can we institutionalize long term thinking? Um, and uh, so here again, as youth is already at the forefront of that mindset, a mindset shift, the best thing you can do is to institutionalize youth empowerment. So, for example, we as UNMGCY, we are very happy to be actively part in the UNDRR's uh, Sunday stakeholder mechanism. And I think that is one of those great, good steps into the right direction. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca, for your, for your views. Um, very important points. Um, and I think if I am to summarize, you, you brought three points in terms of where we, we need to, to focus. One is a system approach. Mm -hmm. And second, go local, involve young people. Third, follow the money. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's really very important because, I mean, it's, it's about how the investments build more resilience. And that is, I think, one of the priority areas of the, the roadmap. And today in the afternoon, there would be a session about that actually in the FDRR. But then also the missing part, cyber jobs training and mindset shift. Um, I think in the, in the multi-hazard context, certainly cyber is becoming uh, an, an important issue and, and certainly it's, uh, we need to, to move more actively there. Now, uh, in terms of linking what we learn from, from the first five years of implementation and how the new roadmap takes on board uh, our, our learning from the previous roadmap, and I would like to go back to your comment, uh, Rebecca, it's all about implementation, it's not about the document. The document is a good document, what do we do with the document? Uh, I would like to invite John Ivers, who uh, is uh, uh, one of the, uh, the key core authors of the review of the previous roadmap, and he uh, worked with all 55 member states and uh, a number of stakeholders to first learn from the previous experience and, and see uh, what was the feedback on the previous roadmap so that the new one addresses those, uh, uh, those uh, gaps. Um, the question to you, John, do you think that the new roadmap and the, the direction this discussion is taking is addressing the, some of the, the priorities or the, the lessons learned, the gaps that have been identified through through your uh, review uh, together with member states and the working group of the previous roadmap? Yes, uh, actually I'm quite energized to hear the different um, contributions from the panel members because a lot of those were the findings of the previous review. The challenges where we started to put in place the, the basic building blocks uh, over five years uh, to move forward the process, but also to move from focusing mostly on natural disasters, to cybersecurity, to technological disasters, to the climate emergency, through transboundary cooperation. And, you know, the proof is in the pudding. It is all about implementation and it is all about investment. But we also needed uh, to put in place the building blocks to get those questions together <coughs> and to be challenged to, to have those focus coherently together. Um, at one po particular point, and, and as Armini pointed out, this, the role of the Sendai focal points in bringing together not just the climate emergency, not just natural disasters, but the whole range of, of hazards which we face uh, at the national and local level was key. So um, the previous five years made very good progress in terms of putting, enabling national and local strategies, but the next 10 years is about concretizing those strategies, bringing in the different supports and the peer reviews, which Armini was involved in, the transboundary cooperation, the common risk assessments to enable collaboration between different groups, as well as to address the, the range of hazards we now face, because we are in a different world than 10, 15 years ago. Um, the hazard uh, environment, the risk environment is, is quite different. So we made some progress, we put in place the building blocks, but now it's quite energized to hear from, from the different contributions that a lot of those thinkings have already gone ahead to, to bring forward. 
I think as well, one of the other things from the review was um, to put in place all of society mechanisms. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has, has really taught us the value on the resources and the contributions from different stakeholders and members of society, uh, bringing those together. So the previous five years, it put in place some structures for dialogue and collaboration. But I think now as we move further forward, as we're hearing from uh, from you, but also we had different sessions uh, throughout the forum on with our disability uh, groups and gender, uh, but also transboundary risks that <coughs> that collaboration is complicated that collaboration needs a common framework but also we see that that collaboration through different regional organizations is being nicely framed is creating different peer review processes and is driving um, the, the process forward especially with a lot of thinking from the national for our sendai focal points from the regional organizations and the contributions from the from the different stakeholders so actually looking at the review from the previous five years and listening to what the panelists um, have energetically put forward it's uh, it's quite heartening to see um, that the, the next 10 years with all the challenges far greater than what we faced before um, are being met with stakeholders uh, far more resourceful than before thank you so much john and um really i think uh, you provided us with some um good connections between what we learned and how we should move forward so i would like to thank uh, all panelists for sharing this um, uh, sharing their views in this first round uh, we have now some uh, some good 30 minutes for q and a's and remarks from the floor so i'd like to open up now the the floor for uh, possible questions and answers and and also interventions please send your your questions will uh, will uh, 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 summarize them and then we'll we'll see how we uh, we address them during the session i uh, know that there are a number of in, uh, uh, colleagues that expressed uh, wish to intervene first with some short remarks and that is particularly focusing on uh, what john mentioned as a priority is the sub-regional collaboration addressing transboundary issues so first i would like to invite uh, mr poznanski um, uh, to to share the views um, of the Council of the Baltic States on the roadmap uh, with a very sh uh, um, a short, if possible, intervention, Mr. Posnianski. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, thank you, Octavian, and uh, thank you, Office, for the, the invitation for this forum. Um, uh, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, it is a really honor that I have uh, an opportunity to represent the Baltic Sea region and specifically our organization, Baltic um, uh, Council of the Baltic Sea States, which consists of EU and non-EU member uh, states around the Baltic Sea region and also the, the EU itself, which is a member in our organization. Uh, so bringing together um, uh, those EU and non-EU partners to work together on a, um, a better integrated, safer and, and secure and uh, more sustainable and prosperous uh, region. Um, in our um, everyday work, um, I, I would like to respond to a lot of things that were said. Um, 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 let me stop only with one. I mean, we, I think that um, I will not focus on this, but but we try to do a lot in engaging youth in general in the work of our organization, but also in uh, specifically in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a civil protection area through through such projects as um, uh, children and youth resilience. Or, or voluntary networks, but, but uh, probably I will talk about it some other time. Uh, let me focus now on a very specific issue here, uh, that, is, uh, that is the local level, um, that, because we believe that the uh, implementation of Sendai framework should take place first and foremost on the local level. Uh, that's where the actual disaster reduction risk is, uh, is done and people are working and need the most support. Uh, I base these statements on the results of, um, of the EU-funded Cascade project, which we run, uh, which, which we brought together civil protection specialists and climate change um, uh, uh, adaptation experts to identify and measure climate risk, uh, um, as well as give recommendations on how to respond to them in the most effective way. 
the main result of the project is a curriculum or a toolbox for city officials with simple, easy to use checklists and templates. And please visit our CBSS electronic booth of this forum, uh, where you will get the information on this project and ready to use tools. Uh, in this project, the partners also interviewed the Sendai focal points in the Baltic region countries, members of the EU civil protection mechanism and the others, and conducted dialogue with the municipalities and city administrations. And here are some um, uh, take-ons from these uh, interviews uh, what the experts have brought. So, um, to overcome barriers to successful incendiary implementation, they recommended the following four points. First, regionalization and tailoring, so sharing solutions based on common and comparable risk in, and similar social economic profiles. The secondly, broader integration of climate risk into national risk assessments. That was also a very strong postulate for the, for the experts, uh, and especially inclusion of climate expert, change experts into the risk assessment teams, uh, as well as collection of uh, new reliable data. And that was already mentioned today. Uh, thirdly, improved understanding of current emergent and future risks at the local level and um, the need for, again, better, better data and guidance on how to use data. And fourthly, uh, strengthen opportunities for collaboration, networking and discussion related to the climate resilience among the local authorities. So as you see, um, a lot is already covered by the by the by the um, uh, by the roadmap and let me add at the end of my intervention uh, um, the, the, this strategies action plans roadmaps that are all in place so we know what are the challenges and how to approach them now it's time for action and we need to act now and we need to act together on all levels local international uh, sub-regional involving civil secure uh, civil society youth academia uh, and I'm really happy to see that, uh, the, and I hope that the roadmap will be very helpful to in this, in this regard. So thank you so much. I'll put the full stop here and I'm ready to answer the questions if there are. Thank you very much, Mr. Pozniansky. Um, we also have a request for uh, the floor from Mr. Jovanovsky from um, uh, the uh, Southeast uh, European Initiative for Disaster Preparedness and Prevention. Mr. Jovanovsky, the floor is yours. Thank you, Octavian. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, it's an honor for me to address this session of uh, EFDRA. Uh, it goes without saying that EFDRA remains the key event on our continent, successfully bringing over the years together all stakeholders and promoting uh, the DRR agenda. Uh, Disaster Preparedness and Prevention Initiative for Southeastern Europe as a family of 10 national civil protection agencies was and will remain a strong contributor to the forum and supporter of its uh, outcomes. Personally, me as a head of secretariat of DPPI was already involved in several of the working sessions, enjoying the spirit of uh, networking and collaboration, which is the main attribute of uh, EFDRR. Even this morning, the technical staff in the checkup, communication checkup, recognize me and say, okay, you, you, you know the drill. Um, echoing what has uh, been already said uh, in the past two days, uh, that we are at the crossroad with COVID-19 and the climate emergency, uh, both calling for all of our efforts and determination if we want to avoid the increase of human and socioeconomic impacts of future shocks. Regional cooperation remains, remains essential if we want to succeed. Uh, and this is not only uh, my personal opinion and the personal of expert community. In 2021, DPPI supported the Regional Cooperation Council for Southeastern Europe in conducting a public survey in the Western Balkans on wider security issues, among them disaster prevention and disaster preparedness. 78% uh, of the survey population considers that through regional cooperation, our countries will be more effective to cope with future disasters. This high percentage reflects the sense of solidarity that exists among our people to always assist their neighbor, but also that it shows that the memories from the major events like the floods in Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, earthquakes in Albania, Croatia, Turkey, they are still fresh uh, in their memories and the region uh, remains, as the region remains highly vulnerable to many types of hazards. In addition to this perception about the need for enhanced regional cooperation, the survey also showed 65 percent of readiness among the people to be actively engaged in community-based preparedness activities. 
This is extremely important knowing that all disasters are happening, uh, happening locally and their solutions are also local. No, knowing what the public thinks and what is their perception uh, of the challenges that we are facing is often forgotten by, by us as the our community. This is one area where we as regional entities can be more proactive, complementing all the national efforts by presenting them a wider regional perspective of trends and challenges. Adding on the importance of the regional cooperation within uh, DPPI, uh, this year for us meant year one in implementing our strategic development plan for the next five years. Uh, last year, after a period of 20 years of existence uh, of DPPI, the member states stopped to reflect on the achievements of, of the network uh, and the ways uh, uh, ahead. Through a process of wide consultation, the dominant opinion among all of them uh, and uh, that DPPI still contributes to the growth of knowledge and capacities in the region of Southeastern Europe. The plan was designed around three pillars, all of them connected with each other through a set of targets and indicators enabling us to measure progress. Our focus remains on trainings through our annual training program is the first pillar, research and analytics to improve the regional overview of main challenges and project management as a third pillar. The implementation of the plan relies on the network that we have created and the partnerships that grew out of that process. Allow me to use this opportunity and to share some few examples in that context. On the training component, we are actively working in the moment with the SPHERE standards in producing trainers that will continue to be spreading the knowledge of the minimum standards in humanitarian response. Together with the Global Logistic Cluster, we just completed our first simulation exercise focusing on logistics aspects. And with V Robotics, we completed the training on using drones in humanitarian operations. On the analytics and research part, I'm very proud to say that in 2021, and thanks to UNDRR Office for Europe and Central Asia, we completed the subnational risk informed index for three countries, Albania, Montenegro, and North Macedonia, having the chance to apply, apply the same model in three countries, offer us the chance to have comparable results, results and a subnational overview on possible areas of interventions to reduce existing risk and avoid new ones. One another important lesson from that process was also the ownership of the fraud processes itself by the national counterparts in the pilot countries that I have mentioned. Their interaction with the model and the possibility to adjust the model to the local circumstances. I hope that in 2022, we will continue working on the risk inform with the, uh, adding additional countries and updating the results that were already presented at this forum. In 2022, we also succeed to translate the UNDRR hazard definition and classic classification review to 10 languages uh, in, in, in DPPI context. The impact of this work is expected in improved reporting, design of national and local DRR strategy, and designing and use of multi-hazard early warning systems. Last but not least, a new member of the uh, as a new member of the regional consultative committee for the Make My City Resilient 2030 campaign, we are in the moment considering few options how to directly support our city to join the campaign and benefit the most out of it. We plan to continue with the same tempo in 2022. Under the creation chairmanship with DPPI, our focus of attention will be DRR financing. We strongly believe that this DRR is not a cost, but investment for a safer future. Prevention saves lives. And if we want to prevent, we need to invest. And if we want to invest, we need to know how, when, and where. The economic case for DRR has also tremendously progressed during the recent years, and many analysis and studies confirm today that DRR investments and finance strategies contribute to great savings in emergency response and recovery costs. Now, with the regional roadmap for DRR, we have a booster shot that should enable us uh, in the next um, EFDRR session after two years to speak more about the results that we've achieved together. DPPI and I will remain on your side for supporting all of your efforts. Finally, I would like to use this opportunity and invite you all, and especially invite Mr. Poznanski and Mr. Ukashev to join us at our regional meeting as, at the advisory board session that is scheduled for the 13th of December. There is a great opportunity between our two, three organizations to share, to exchange, and to learn from each other, which is not explored so far. I thank you and I wish you a very fruitful discussion during the day. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Ivanovsky. Without any further delays, I would like to invite Mr. Ukashev to share really two or three thoughts because we're running out of time. Thank you so much. Я буду, уважаемые коллеги, очень краток. Хочу подчеркнуть о том, что Европейский форум по снижению риска бедствий является региональной платформой для Европы и что для меня самое главное и Центральной Азии. И, э, да, и э, поэтому э, я хочу сказать о том, что, будучи э, какой-то частью всего вот этого большого, э, большой платформы в этой области, вот, я хочу сказать, что мы понимаем те задачи, которые стоят перед нашими странами, перед регионом Центральной Азии. И э, господин Бивал сам был свидетелем того, как мы <coughs> на, э, в регионе Центральной Азии Укрепляем региональное сотрудничество в сфере снижения риска бедствий. В частности, приведу такие факты, что совсем недавно, в ноябре месяце, был проведен очередной региональный форум совещания глав чрезвычайных ведомств стран Центральной Азии. Это мероприятие высокого политического уровня. И итогом этого мероприятия было протокольное решение. И главным, первым документом было это одобрение региональной стратегии развития стран Центральной Азии в области снижения риска бедствий на 2022-2030 годы. И, естественно, это как бы для того, чтобы реализовать эту стратегию вот, огромными усилиями экспертов и национальных, и региональных, и управления ООН по снижению риска бедствий, других агентств ООН. Мы также, чтобы вот быть вместе с вами, разработали свою дорожную карту по реализации этой стратегии. И надеюсь, надеюсь, что вот то, что в дорожной карте указано, оно будет выполнено. В частности, дорожная карта Европейского форума на 2021-2030 годы поддерживает реализацию Синдайской рамочной программы следующим образом, что интересно для нашего региона. Это поддержка региональных, национальных и местных стратегий и действий по снижению риска бедствий путем выявления общих пробелов, проблем и возможностей для повышения устойчивости к бедствиям в регионе. В регионе. Выявление эффективных механизмов для обмена передовым опытом, путями и возможностями на национальном и местном уровнях для более ориентированной на риски гендерной и инклюзивной политики, стратегии, программы, подходов. И, конечно же, нас интересует о том, что в этой дорожной карте четко прописано, что каким образом будут выделяться ресурсы, инвестироваться в это. И мы надеемся общими усилиями, ну, у нас другого выхода нету, общими усилиями мы реализуем эту стратегию развития сотрудничества в рамках дорожной карты Европейского форума по снижению риска бедствий на 2021-2030 годы. Спасибо вам, я поздравляю вас за эту большую работу. Thank you, спасибо. Thank you so much, Mr. Rukashev. We have uh, uh, seven minutes left for the, some uh, last questions from to the panelists in this session. And I, uh, we, we received two questions. Uh, one is addressed specifically to Dmitry Mariasin. How could regional organizations such as the EU, CBSS, DPPI, CSDRR best contribute to addressing risks? And perhaps that could be directly answered by Dmitry. We will share that question um, uh, after this session and uh, we will uh, then provide the answer to, res to the respective um, um, uh, organizations. And question two is, how will the Sendai Framework Focal Points coordinate the implementation of the roadmap in years ahead? I'd like maybe this question to, to, to address to the panelists. Um, uh, Armini, very quickly, how do you think very practically now the Sendai Focal Points could uh, implement the roadmap? First of all, thank you for the question. And I must mention that it is very important to say that uh, yesterday at the ministerial roundtable, we had already uh, a mention of the important role of the Sendai Focal Points at this uh, at the implementation of uh, Sendai framework. Uh, the one important thing we must understand, the Sendai Focal Points are, uh, are ambassadors. We are voice, we are bridge, we are warriors. That's the way we can uh, assure the implementation. That's the way if we unite, 
If we have the strength from UNDRR Secretariat, which we have certainly, and uh, we thank for that, and we cooperate together with our governments, that's the only way. As I said, we are voice, you, we are warrior, warriors. Thank you. Thank you, Armini. Mr. Aydake, very quickly, uh, one practical suggestion from you. How can this and focal point support it? <clears throat> Я думаю, сегодня, когда практически большинство населения мира понимает слово бедствие, от COVID-19, да, многие, многих стало понимание этого слова. Поэтому это получается для нас, вот, это очень хороший инструмент для того, чтобы двигаться вперед. Ребекка здесь правильно сказала, что чуть-чуть бюрократию уменьшаем и двигаемся вперед. То есть есть посылы хорошие, есть позитивные. И сегодняшний вот... Форум проходящий, можно говорить об этом. И так получается, мы получаем мощный инструмент. Население знает, и мы должны их вовлекать в процесс и двигаться вперед. И тогда будет результат. Thank you. Thank you. И этой ситуацией мы обязаны воспользоваться. Thank you so much. Rebecca, one practical next step. What should we doing next for the roadmap? One thing. The most effective. <laughs> Um, maybe a role that hasn't been mentioned yet is the role of nature. Mm -hmm. In every discussion I had here in the conference so far, this was always coming up. In the end, we need to invite nature back into our concrete jungles and find the respect also towards nature. Very, very important point. And John, you have the last floor since you're uh, in a way the voice of 55 Sendai focal points. You listen to them. What should the Sendai, National Sendai Focal Points do next to implement the roadmap? Uh, I think invest in the Sendai Focal Points, support them through the regional and sub-regional organizations and continue to support and UNDRR. They have to bring together so many complex issues that peer support is essential. Thank you. That was very practical, very clear. I would like to thank all panelists, the keynote speakers, all participants, excellent questions that we received. Uh, Dmitry, we will address the specific question to you. You'll have a chance to answer uh, directly to, to colleagues that uh, asked you this particular question. With this, I think we're approaching the end of our session. Uh, the, uh, the, the panel provided a number of uh, very um, uh, important ideas on the way uh, forward, how we really um, uh, prove that this is not just a, a document with good ideas, but this is a roadmap. And we implement this roadmap um, um, between now and 2030 for a more resilient region. Um, we have also very practical suggestions and that is that we, we really need now to take it to the national Sendai focal points to provide member states through the, the Sendai focal points, the platform to continue bringing together efforts, uh, share ideas, share good practices, share common challenges in a way that, uh, that we um, uh, advance very practically on the priorities set by this roadmap. And, I hear also uh, from Armenia and, and from John that um, uh, there, is, um, uh, there is a request also from Sendai Focal Points to, uh, to, to UNDR as a secretariat to continue uh, providing support to these processes, which we would be very pleased to do. And perhaps a very practical step that I, as a, as a regional head of, uh, of UNDRR, uh, would like to take forward is to have a first uh, meeting of national Sendai focal points after EFDRR to focus actually on the practicalities and how we, we now focus on very concrete steps as of um, maybe tomorrow. We're not going to have another meeting tomorrow, but as of tomorrow uh, to, to start very practically move forward. It's, uh, it's my great pleasure to thank all contributors to the session, the keynote speakers, uh, also the contributors from the floor, all participants, of course, uh, the uh, organizers of the session, the host country, Portugal, uh, for offering us the opportunity to be in this um, uh, wonderful um, uh, city of Matosinis and this, uh, this uh, uh, hybrid format uh, where we have some colleagues in the, in the conference room and also many colleagues that joined us uh, online. And uh, uh, as we advance uh, with the uh, agenda for the second day of the FDRR, we're looking forward to have some, some more interactions during the day today and then uh, see you all in the afternoon for the closing ceremony of the uh, EFDRR. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Obrigado.